Welcome to the army and battle section of my Lizardmen guide. In this section we'll be going over the entire Lizardmen roster and covering all their units pros and cons, as well as compositions and formations for battle. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experiences and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the Lizardmen in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. A little bonus disclaimer for this one, some of these words are really hard to say, so I apologise in advance for butchering your favourite factions or places. If you'd like to send a complaint, please email uratw at mate.co.uk. With that being said, let's get into the video. The Lizardmen units are again, more focused on quality over quantity. This means it is more expensive to recruit and maintain armies, but they will also hold their own much better when compared to cheap units from the same stage of the game. They also have a strong focus on tough melee units and devastating monsters, with a much weaker side when it comes to ranged infantry, and of course they have the crown jewel of the Lizardmen, the monster mounted artillery. Lizardmen also have a few pitfalls however. Their Saurus infantry are all quite slow, so will have trouble catching up to nearly any other infantry unit in the game, so can be exhausted by weak units if you let them chase. A lot of units are also prone to going on a rampage when their leadership falls below a certain threshold. If this is primal instincts, this will cause them to gain a couple of stat buffs, but either way they are going to be totally out of control and attack the nearest enemy regardless of how they match up. This can be used to your advantage, but it's definitely something to be wary of. That being said, let's get into the roster. Before we get into this guide, I do just want to remind you that this giveaway going on, you could win Total War Warhammer 2, the game, for free from me. You don't need to subscribe, you don't need to like, you don't need to do any of that stuff. You just go to the link in the description, put in a little bit of information so I can get in contact with you, and then do any of the entry stuff, and then you'll be entered in the prize draw to win. You do have to not own the game previously, and I will be checking this, so just make sure that you don't, because that's kind of scummy. Right, onto the video. Kicking us off is the Skink Cohort, and for a starting game unit, they're actually pretty great. They're aquatic so have no movement penalty when moving through water which, while being very situational, can be very useful as most of the factions start off in or near to a swamp. This will allow them to flank from anywhere on the battlefield without being inhibited by movement penalties. They're also a shielded unit so will take less damage from ranged attacks which come in very useful as they're not the toughest units anyway and benefit from the added survivability. They come in two varieties, standard and javelins. Picking javelins gives them a low ammo ranged attack that you can use before charging into battle, which can do some pretty good damage as long as you pick your targets well. Either version are a great addition to your early game armies, but more as a flanking and support unit rather than your actual frontline troops. I take 2 to 4 of them, and when I can get javelins, I do, as the minor increase in costs are well worth the ranged attack. Red Crested Skinks are up next, and these guys are pretty interesting for what stage in the game you unlock them at. They're pretty fast and aquatic so will have no trouble flanking or chasing enemies across any type of terrain. They also have the frenzy ability so will perform much better if you get them into melee before they lose any leadership, and will slowly get worse as they start to waver. They have poison attacks so any unit they fight in melee will get debuffed and give your units an advantage against anyone affected. Finally we come to their main draw on what makes them such a great early game unit. They are armor piercing so can go against much tougher units and do a considerable amount of damage to them even if they don't come out on top. Unfortunately, they often don't come out on top due to a lack of armour or shields. This means they will take a large amount of damage from all sources, so aren't going to outlast many opponents. But this doesn't mean they are useless, as their good speed and damage make them great at flanking and chasing tougher units. I take three of these, along with two ranged skinks with me, into the early to mid game to have some variety to my damage. Next up are the Soros Warriors, and now we get into the real meat of the Lizardmen. These guys may not be armoured, but they are super tough from being basically dinosaurs, so can last a really long time in battle, even if they're against superior units to themselves. They also have predatory sensors, again, from being dinosaurs, which means that they can detect nearby enemies without having the line of sight, which makes them great at avoiding flanks and surprise attacks. They do have the primal instincts trait, meaning when they get in a tough situation, they can go into a rampage and get out of control, as I mentioned before. They also come in two varieties, standard and shields. Taking shields give the unit shields, no surprises there. This obviously means that they will be more defended from range attacks, but does come at the cost of some minor stat differences. I always take shields exclusively once I can, as they just make all the difference when you're getting bombarded from afar. All in all, they're a great unit that are perfect for holding the front lines for an ungodly amount of time, and giving your fast units time to get around on flank. I take 4 of them in the early game, all the way until the end of the mid game, as nothing else on the roster comes close to them until then. Sora's Spears are a very similar unit to Warriors, but with one major difference, they drop their maces in exchange for spears giving them proficiency against larger units. 
They get a damage bonus against them and also have charge defense, so are great for protecting your flanks from any cav charge the enemy can throw at you. They share the predatory senses and primal instincts of warriors, so are hard to flank and sometimes even harder to control. They also have the same two varieties as warriors of standard and shields, and again, I would say always go for shields once you can, as it just makes worlds of difference when going against anyone with ranged damage. I take two of them with me to focus down any large units and to protect my flanks from any charges. If the enemy doesn't bring anything large however, they can do just fine against most infantry units and will last a very long time due to their natural armour. Finally, we come down to the crown jewel of the Lizardmen infantry, the Temple Guard. They combine the best aspects of all the previous units and put them into an almost perfect unit. Their armour piercing, so do great damage against anything no matter how thick the armour is. They're armoured and shielded on top of having that natural toughness, so are near impossible to take out if the enemy doesn't bring any good armour piercing. They have charge defence against large, as well as a bonus to any damage dealt to large units, so are machines absorbing cav charges and making sure they aren't able to come back for another one. Finally, they also have predatory sensors, so are near impossible to flank even when moving hidden. With all these benefits, it's no surprise that I choose to replace all my Saurus infantry with these guys to have six of them as my main front line. Their only downside is the speed, they're still quite slow so will struggle to chase down basically anything that can run. This means you will have to account for this by bringing something fast to chase down anyone who does run, but at the stage of the game you get these guys at, you don't really have to worry about that. It might also be a good idea to use guard mode to ensure your units don't chase anything that flees all the way to France if you forget to keep an eye on them. Overall though, they are a fantastic melee infantry unit and you'll struggle to find anything better overall in any faction. Skink Skirmishers are the first of the two units of ranged infantry that the Lizardmen have access to, not counting the Javelins. Normally, ranged units tend to be my favourite, but to be honest, for this faction I'm really quite underwhelmed. They're a skirmishing unit, so are good for firing on the move and doing little attack runs here and there, but they just don't do enough damage to make them viable for most things. They do have vanguard deployment, so that helps them with getting off some early shots before running back to your lines. They also are aquatic, so won't be slowed down when moving through water, which is always a great bonus. As mentioned before, they can fire whilst moving and also deal poison damage, so it'll be pretty difficult for enemies to catch up with them unless they have some cavalry to send in. When I do take them, I take 2 to 4, and I only really keep them in the early game when I have no other choice of ranged damage. They aren't the best, but if I'm using them, I'll either put them as close as I can to the enemies to get plenty of shots off before melee begins, or I'll keep them safe near my army and use them to flank around once the units are locked in combat to get some shots off on the enemy backs. Chameleon Skinks are very similar to Skirmishers. They have Vanguard deployments so can be dropped very close to the enemy lines, but thanks to their Chameleon ability, they can remain hidden for a long time, allowing them to get in some pretty good positions. This ability also grants them some missile resistance, so while they are a very fragile unit, they can hold it together when under some light ranged fire. They're very fast and aquatic, so can move around just about any battlefield. They can also fire whilst moving, so are good for harassing enemies rather than being killing machines themselves. And again, these attacks are poisonous, so will debuff as well as damage. I'll replace all my skirmishes with these guys until I unlock something more versatile, which I'll come back to later. Again, the use is very similar to skirmishes. Either place them up close and harass as they come to you, or keep them safe and use them to flank after melee has been established. Feral Cold Ones are the first of the cavalry units available to the Lizardmen. They're armoured and deal armour piercing damage, so are great for going against some pretty tough units as long as they don't have armour piercing or anti-large damage. Even though they are okay to use in sustained melee, I found the best way to use them, as with most cavalry, is to either do short cycle charges or use them to chase down any retreating units to ensure they don't come back. The one major downside of these guys is that they are very prone to rampaging when combat doesn't go their way. If I'm taking them, I'll take just a couple to use for flanking ranged units and to keep retreating units running. Cold One Riders are basically feral cold ones but with a rider and a bit more composure. They're armoured and shielded so are pretty hard to take out in both melee and from range. They deal armour piercing damage so again they're good at taking on some pretty tough units. They also have predatory sensors so are great for sending out to detect any ambushes before your front lines get too close. Unfortunately they also have primal instincts so can go into a rampage if they get overwhelmed, but they will hold their composure far better than feral cold ones. I would replace Feral Cold Ones with these guys as soon as you can, as the shields and increased leadership just make them better at all the same jobs in basically every way. You can actually use these guys for some light sustained melee combat as long as it is against something weak. This means less micro, which in my book is a good thing. They come in two varieties, maces and spears. Spears do what they normally do, grant some anti-large damage at the cost of some minor stat differences. If you're going to take spears, then it's definitely a good idea to choose your targets more carefully so that you're giving them the best chance at doing lots of damage. If you're going for anything too large or elite though, it's worth cycle charging as they'll still get beaten in sustained melee. Either variety are a good choice, so it's really a case of what you're going up against. 
The Salamander Hunting Pack is our first range unit that I can totally recommend since the Javelins. They fire in a single direction and only when stood still so they lose out on mobility, but the advantages heavily outnumber this. They fire arm piercing projectiles that cause fire damage as well as having some minor explosive effects. They're aquatic so can move very quickly over most types of terrain, so we'll have no trouble getting into position where you need them. They deal bonus damage to large units at range, so are great at whittling down any huge units or totally breaking some smaller cavalry units. The only real downside is that they have primal instincts, but as long as you keep them back behind your front lines, you should have nothing to worry about. I like to replace skirmishers with these guys as soon as I can, but I only bring two for me, as the firepower lets me leave room for other units. You can use them pretty much the same as any other ranged units. Place them ahead of your front lines as the enemy approaches to get a bunch of shots off before melee begins. Pull them back before lines clash, and then try to move them to the backs or sides of enemies to minimise friendly fire from minor explosions. Once they're out of ammo, don't be afraid to send them into melee with some weak units or chase down some retreating ones as they do a fair bit of damage and are really quite fast. The horned ones are up next, and then the elite ground cavalry of the Lizardmen roster. Looking at their cards, they do look very similar to Cold One Riders in most ways, but they improve on just about everything just a little bit and it can make all the difference. They're incredibly tough due to being armoured and shielded, are good at attacking some pretty tough units with armour piercing damage, are great at detecting hidden enemies before your main army gets there with their predatory sensors, and while they do have primal instinct, they'll take quite a bit more of a beating before they start to lose control. I'd replace any ground melee cavalry you have with these guys as soon as you can, as they just do everything better. As usual, the strategy is to use them to flank around the front lines to target weaker ranged and artillery units. If this isn't possible, then send them to chase down retreating units until they're dead or shattered. Since they are so tough, you can leave them in some mild sustained melee, but it's worth keeping an eye on them as they're easily taken out if outnumbered. Finally, we come to the Ripidactyl Riders. They're a flying melee cavalry unit, and to be honest, when I first saw them, I thought they were going to be kinda bad. Well, I'm happy to say that it never felt so good to be wrong, as these guys knocked it out of the park of my expectations. Looking at them on paper versus some horned ones, I wasn't sure, but in battle, the applications that they perform better than the horned ones just made them an easy choice. For one, they're armour piercing, so you're not losing out on any damage and can take on the same calibre of units. They're also anti-infantry, so we'll get a bonus when fighting anything the size of the man, and are great at taking out ranged infantry. They have vanguard deployment, so it can be placed right in front of the enemy to get an early charge off before they can react. Finally, they have the frenzy ability, so will perform with a bonus right out the gate if you get them in before losing any leadership. I'd take two of them and replace my ground cavalry once I unlock monsters, as they fill the hole much better in a full stack. I use them to charge into ranged units as I said before, but they're also very good at taking out other flying units of the same size and sometimes bigger, which is extremely useful when you can't afford to take some ranged units to give chase. It's worth waiting for the lines to clash when attacking ground units, as if they get swarmed and cannot take off again, then they won't last long at all. Now we come to the monsters, and from now on it gets really exciting. First off is the Feral Bastilodon. It's armoured like a tank and deals armour piercing melee damage, so it can go up against some of the most elite units in the game and come out relatively unscathed. It also causes terror, so it can be great for getting an early hole in the enemy front lines by causing enemy units to flee as soon as they see it. This lets your units pour through the gap and get some flanking very early on in the fight. If I can afford to, then I take two of these guys around with you as soon as you unlock them, as they are literally tanks that you can throw into the thick of melee and they'll just do work against anything that isn't anti-large. They're not the fastest, but they're fast enough to get around the enemy's backs once the lines are established, and can cause some serious leadership penalties by doing so. They aren't quite fast enough to chase down fleeing units however, so be sure to keep an eye on them so they don't run off to the edge of the map chasing something. The only real downside is that these units are prone to going onto rampages if they lose enough leadership. They come in three varieties, Standard, Revivification Crystal, and Arc of Sotek. Both non-standard varieties are not prone to rampaging, so you can always count on them to follow your orders. The Crystal version gets the ability to replenish and even revive injured and fallen troops in the battle, which is extremely useful, especially as it can be locked in combat and still use the ability. The Arc version gets poison attacks and the Arc of Sotic ability, which gives them some great debuffs and damage to all nearby enemy units. This makes them great when surrounded, and lets you be outnumbered and still come out on top. It's also worth noting that both non-standard varieties also get a team of skinks on the back to do some light range damage to surrounding units. It's needless to say that if you can go for the Arc and Crystal versions as soon as you can, then they can last you all the way to the end of the game. Crotzigors are up next, and they are the monstrous infantry powerhouse of the Lizardmen. They're big, they're fast, and they've got more armour than a tiger tank and hit about as hard as them too. They deal armour piercing damage with their huge hammers in a small area of effect around them, so it can dish out huge amounts of damage every single swing. They also have predatory sensors, so it can detect nearby enemies without needing to see them, which is exceptionally useful when you're advancing through unknown terrain. They are prone to primal instincts too, and at this point if you don't know what that means then I don't know what to tell you. I take two of them with me as soon as I can, and use them to support my front lines when engaging with any particularly tough units. 
since they deal AoE damage, they're also pretty good at breaking up front lines and making it easier for your small units to chip away at the enemy. Since they're also pretty fast, you can actually use them to do some minor chasing and flanking if you get the chance, but definitely isn't their best use. The Feral Stegodon is next up to bat. It's very similar to the Bastilodon with some minor stat differences that I believe give it an edge. It's slightly less armoured but still a tank so it can take huge amounts of damage in combat. It dishes out an increased amount of armour piercing damage so it can shred through the enemy front lines like Swiss cheese. It also causes terror so it's very useful for breaking the enemy even faster in the thick of battle. And finally, you guessed it, it is prone to rampages. Unfortunately it's quite slow so isn't the best at chasing down anything that's fleeing but if you keep it in the front lines then you're sure to see it rack up quite a number of kills. Depending on when you unlock them, you can use them to replace any Feral Bastilodons you have, but if you've unlocked the Arc and Crystal versions, then the slight stat improvements don't warrant taking the Stegodon instead. Our final melee monster is the Feral Carnosaur, and I could just show you this guy and end the video right there. But I won't do that because there's still so much left to talk about. He's armoured so can take ridiculous amounts of punishment in battle before he even breaks a sweat. He deals huge amounts of armor piercing damage and can literally eat some units like a light snack. He also has a bonus against large targets, so don't be afraid to send him against some cav or even a huge unit provided he has support, as chances are he'll come out on top. Obviously he's prone to going on rampages, but it honestly isn't a problem as he can go after basically anything and he's going to do well. There isn't really a wrong way to use them either, you can just use them in your front lines or have them flank around, you can use them to focus range units or chase down runners with their great speed, you can send them against the worst that the enemy has to offer and they'll just push through and be ready for more. I take two of them into the endgame with me to replace my Croxigors, but if you wanted 19 of them, that'd probably work too. Finally, we come to the last of my favourite category of the Lizardman roster, the Missile Beasts and Monsters. First up are the Pterodon Riders. They're a flying ranged unit and come with Vanguard deployments, so are great for getting early shots off on the enemy before they get too close to melee. They can fire whilst moving and deal poison damage, so are great at harassing enemy units with no flying units of their own very easily. This gives them easy shots into the enemy backs and forces them to either have their backs to their front lines or just take harassment and be gradually whittled down. They also have the Drop Rocks ability which allows them to drop heavy stones below them and cause some great damage to clumps of infantry. They come in two varieties, standard and fire leech bowlers. Opting for fire leech gives them a bonus against infantry and makes their attacks deal fire damage and have a very light explosive effect. This makes them exceptional at harassing less armoured infantry and artillery units as long as they don't get caught out in melee. I take two units of whichever I have unlocked at the time and Fire Leech come with me into the endgame as their damage output and harassment ability is a godsend. Up next is the Ancient Salamander and they are an exceptional unit. They're basically like the Salamander hunting pack combined into one absolute unit of a lizard. They're armoured and deal armour piercing damage so can devastate enemies from far away and up close and not have a scratch to show for it. They also cause terror so if you do want to use them in melee, the attacker won't be sticking around too long. Of course they are also prone to primal instincts but they should really be kept away from melee for the majority of your battles so you shouldn't have to worry about it. The missiles they fire are bigger and badder than their little brothers so you want to make sure you're picking your targets to avoid dealing too much damage to your own units. This shouldn't be a problem as they're pretty fast so you can get to the sides or behind enemies in good time to do lots of damage. Once they eventually do run out of ammo, they are more than capable in melee and are great for chasing down retreat units or taking on a unit or two of mid tier infantry at push but don't let them get overwhelmed. I take two of them with me into the endgame to replace my hunting packs. The Bastilodon with Solar Engine is next up and it's pretty damn good. It has all the attributes of the standard Bastilodon, so it's built like a tank and can output the same damage as one in melee as well as causing terror, but using this guy in melee is a severe waste of his talents. The beam of Chotek launching its Solar Engine on his back is a direct fire killing machine. It launches beams of insane damage that blind enemies hit and is amazing at targeting both clumps of infantry and large units alike. It does require you to have a good angle on your enemies though as it fires in a direct line so it will hit your troops if you try and get a hit from right behind them. I take two of them as soon as I can and keep them in the back of my lines to do some great damage as enemies get nearer to make my infantry's job even easier. They're also still a Bastildon so if they get flanked by Carve or infantry they'll be able to hold their own pretty easily and get back to firing in no time. On top of all that, they and every other monstrous artillery unit get a team of skinks on their backs that fire off poison damage even when they're in melee. The Stegodon is very similar in a lot of ways but also very different. While it's basically just a Stegodon with some range units attached to it, it has a very different range attack and can be used in a different way to the solar engine. It of course has great armour and armour piercing damage in melee from being a bloody dinosaur, as well as causing terror. It now has an added ranged poison attack so it can do some great damage both from the impact and over time to any units hit. It fires an arc so it doesn't need to have as good an angle as the solar engine but it's still worth trying to get in on a flank just to maximise your damage and minimise your friendly fire. 
While it does not do as much damage with the impact switch ranged attack, it does do some decent poison damage as well as debuffing enemies hit. This is more helpful for your whole army, so I do choose to take these guys over solar engines, meaning two units in my mid game armies. Again, since they are still dinosaurs, even if they get flanked and forced into melee, they're going to hold their own just fine, so rarely need much protection. As usual, they also get their little ranged skink team to give them just a touch more support in the shorter ranges. Finally, we come to our final and possibly most exciting artillery unit, the Ancient Stegodon. While it seems very similar to the normal Stegodon, and it actually is, you'll soon see why I'm hyping it up so much. The base variety is in fact very similar to the normal Stegodon, with some tweaks to stats that make it a better damage dealer and more capable in combat at the cost of a decreased range. It does great poison damage from a good range, so it can severely weaken enemies before they even get near to you with some great damage and debuffs. It fires in an arc so you don't have to worry about getting an angle too much, but it does help with minimising friendly fire. And again, since they are still dinosaurs we're talking about here, they will fend for themselves in melee just fine should they get forced into it, but again, this isn't the best use of them. They come in two varieties, Standard and Engine of the Gods. Engine of the Gods takes away some of the ranged capability and damage, and gives the unit a unique ability in return. This ability is a highly damaging beam of energy that travels in a straight path from where you cast it on the ground for a considerable distance. Anything hit by this beam is either killed or so toasted that it goes running with very little chance of it coming back. It can only use this ability from a short range however, so it's best to keep these guys either in or very close to melee so that you're using them on the largest clumps of enemies you can. It's got a limited number of uses, but it's still a good idea to use it on cooldown to ensure you're dealing the most damage you can over the course of the battle. To top it all off, it also has an aura of 5% damage resistance for itself and allies, as well as passively increasing the winds of magic power recharge rate. It also goes without saying at this point that both of these guys have the very own skink ranged units to give them that little bit more of an edge. I choose to take one of each of these guys into the endgame with me to replace the regular Stegodons so that I have some variety to the damage being put out. Now we come to the Regiments of Renown. I'll list off the units, what they're a unit of, and the differences they bring. The cohort of Sotek are a unit of red crested skinks. They get bonuses to leadership, melee attack and defense, as well as becoming unbreakable and getting the self augment refuse to die. The Legion of Shakwa are Saurus Spears units, and they get bonuses to armor, leadership, melee attack and defense, and get the Shield of Tlaqua ability. The Star Chamber Guardians are a Temple Guard unit. They get bonuses to leadership, melee attack and defense, Charge Defense against all, Magical Attacks, and the Guardian ability. The Umbral Tide are a Salamander Hunting Pack unit. They get bonuses to Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, Missile Damage, and Perfect Vigor. The Pop Hopak Cohort are a Cold One Spear Riders unit. They gain bonuses to Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, as well as gaining Vanguard Deployment. The Pahok Sentinels are a Pterodon Riders unit. They gain bonuses to Leadership, Melee Attack and Defense, missile damage, as well as getting some physical resistance. The Colossodon Hunters are a Ripidactyl Riders unit. They gain bonus to leadership, melee attack and defense, as well as being converted to anti-large and gaining the Toad Rage trait. The Thunderous One is an ancient Stegodon unit. It gains bonuses to leadership, melee attack and defense, and missile damage, as well as getting the Judgment of Uxmak ability. The Blessed Spawnings are unique to Lizardmen and are awarded for completing certain quests in the campaign. They can be recruited directly to your armies for no cost, and have some very slight differences to the base units. Blessed Saurus Warriors gain 6 armor, 8 leadership, 21 melee attack, 5 melee defense, 17 weapon strength, 6 charge bonus, and perfect vigor. Blessed Saurus Spears units gain 13 armor, 8 leadership, 13 melee attack, 11 melee defense, and 4 weapon strength. Blessed Temple Guards gain 6 armor, 8 leadership, 8 melee attack, and 16 melee defense. Blessed Skink Skirmishers gain 13 leadership, 7 speed, 3 weapon strength, 5 ammo, 2 missile damage, and a resistance to magic. Blessed Chameleon Skinks gain 8 leadership, 3 weapon strength, 10 charge bonus, 10 ammo, 10 range, and 5 missile damage. Blessed Cold One Spear Riders gain 7 armor, 8 leadership, 14 speed, 10 melee attack, 8 charge bonus, and they no longer rampage. Blessed Horned Ones gain 8 leadership, 15 melee attack, 8 melee defense, and no longer rampage. Blessed Pterodon Riders with Fire Leech Bowlers gain 8 leadership, 84 speed, and 28 ammo. Blessed Croxigors gain 8 leadership, 8 melee attack, 8 melee defense, 28 charge bonus, and the ability to cause terror. Blessed Carnosaurs gain 3 leadership, 25 speed, 12 melee attack, 10 charge bonus, and a resistance to magic. Blessed Stegodons gain 8 leadership, 22 ammo, 36 range, and perfect vigor. 
And finally, blessed Bastilodons with solar engines gain 15 armor, 8 leadership, 50 missile damage, and perfect vigor. Now we come to my ideal composition for the endgame in the campaign. I take 6 units of temple guards as my frontline troops. They're there to hold for a long time against anything that gets thrown at them. I take 2 ancient salamanders to do some range damage, and to get some flanking shots done once I'm engaged in melee and before they engage. 2 pterodon riders with fire leech bowers to get some harassment from behind the front lines or to focus on tough ranged units. 2 ripperdal riders to charge down any ranged units that are causing me trouble or to take out anything flying that the enemies bring. 2 feral carnosaurs to basically do anything because there is no enemy they can't go after. 2 bastilodons, one with the arc of sotek and one with a revivification crystal so I can spam their abilities to buff my troops and debuff the enemies. One Ancient Stegodon to do some great range damage, and one Ancient Stegodon with the Engine of the Gods so that I can spam that on Godly Laser. And finally, I take one Lord and one Hero to complement them, meaning if the Lord is magic, take physical damage. If they're physical damage, take some magic. Now to see how this army performs in battle, I'll hand you over to Miles. Take it away. Thanks Miles. Okay, so we're just going to slowly stand to start off and just see what I'm actually going to do for my first orders. Actually, we need to play this a little bit. Okay, so they've already used an ability on me, that's just fine. Yep, there we go, I've just started the whole charge. What I've done here is I've sent these guys, I didn't actually use Vanguard Pump, I probably should have, but uh, I was kind of trying to get that uh, formation pick, but you know how it is. All right, so you can see that I'm sending my entire front line basically just up. That's just to get them in a good position, then I can send them off to go against targets uh, as they get nearer. I've sent my flying guys to go to the back, so the, the space is going to force their entire ranged infantry to either take on these guys and ignore the entire oncoming units of infantry or just take what these guys are doing and you know prepare for this which no matter what they do they're not really going to come out on top because either i'm going to do damage to them from behind or my entire arm is going to get there completely untouched so uh, let's just play this at normal speed see what happens now the unfortunate thing is that look all these guys are pretty slow i mean the can swords are actually kind of fast and uh my Saurus old blood because he's in a can saw and the, uh, the ancient salamanders but apart from that everything is kind of slow Right, so these guys are here now, so I'm sending them to some targets. I've sent these guys to attack, uh, what is this? I have some plague monks. Uh, these guys are anti infantry. Yes, they are. So they're going to do some great damage against those guys, which is really essential because look at the stats for that for the uh, plague monks there. They do loads of damage. And I've sent these guys against some... Why have I just sent them against? I think it's uh, some storm vermin or some other plague monks. So they're going to do some excellent damage. These guys I haven't actually used yet, but I will soon enough. Alright, so these guys have got in range. So the Ancient Salamander is aiming at some uh, Storm Vermin, because he has that great armor piercing and a thunderous one. He's going to be aiming for some Plague Monks, because they have less armor, and uh, he does poison damage. And he does do arm piercing as well, so he's just going to do lots of great damage there. Alright, the Ancient Salamander here, he's firing into this big clump where our Soros Old Blood is, along with the Feral Carnosaur. And also the Engine of the Gods, he's also there. Right, let's slow this down, because a lot's happening. Right, so I sent him my dinosaurs when they got there, because I might as well. The Ark of Sotek, uh, that's always going to do well, so I tried to get him into a clump, but these guys didn't engage. So when I use his ability, it's only really going to hit these guys, but that's totally fine. The Temple Guard now here, uh, engage with some Storm Vermin. These guys are going to engage with these. And then, you know, they're all going to basically go with the, the, the uh, thing that's nearest. The Mass... Uh, I'm not, I don't even know how to name this one. The Crystal... Bastildon, he's now going into here, and he's going to provide these guys some healing spot because they will really need it because, you know, they're going against a lot of anti-large and armor piercing, which is totally fine. We're taking a lot of fire from the Teeth Breakers rattling gun, and they have broken a unit of my Fire Leech Bowlers, but that's totally fine. It's all going according to plan, don't worry. Mazda Mun is just sat here, he's chilling out, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be doing some stuff in a minute. Just you wait. All right, there we are. I've just used my Ripidactyls. I've sent these guys. I think they're all going to attack this artillery over here and the range units because I really just want to get rid of those. Pterodons have rallied and I'm pretty sure I'm about to send them back in. So yeah, look, there we go. Onto that wall planting cannon and onto the uh, other wall planting cannon. And all these range units here have just completely scarred and that sounds as that. And look, we've got some great break in here from the Plague Monks and the Storm Vermin, which is very good going against my Temple Guard. Temple Guard have taken a lot of damage, but again, nothing to worry about. Mazda Mundi getting in there. He did manage to avoid that spell, which is very useful. This game has some great spells. We have a little bit of rampaging going on over here from the Carnosaurs, but like I said earlier, that is really nothing to worry about. The Pterodons over here have basically gone untouched and are just wrecking shop and just doing loads of damage to their infantry, which is fantastic. The Feral Carnosaur is chasing down this Lord, and I would be very, very, very scared if I was him. Ancient Salamander again getting some great shots in, completely uncontested. No one has touched these guys. I think... 
do use the engine of the gods at some point, so we're going to have to watch out for that because that is always great to see. Oh, there, Lords and Gedrim are. I see how it is. Now, you will see a lot of units kind of stood still because with an army this big, it is kind of hard to give everyone orders. So the Lord, which is actually a Doom Wheel, because I'm playing with the mod that lets you have Lords of any units. Just ignore it. It's basically the same. He's going after my uh, Ancient Salamander, but the Feral Cantor, I spotted it, and I've sent him in along with some Temple Guard to quell that. Other units of Temple Guard engaging with a Grey Seer, and he's going to do some great damage. We have got some chasing going off, because I didn't use Guard Mode like I said I should. That's exactly why I should use it, because these guys just run off along with my Lord, which is terrible. But we're getting some great range damage from those guys uh, into my Temple Guard over here. That is not good, so I'll send my Feral Carnosaurs and some Pterodons to do some damage to that. It's important to remember that anti-infantry does not just mean melee infantry, it also means ranged. So they are exceptionally good at taking out these, uh, what are they? Death Globe Bombardiers, which is very good. And there we go, I noticed my Temple Guard have run away and I've kind of made it into a flank and looped them around into all these guys. And there we see the mass break is happening. And I believe that that is a victory in just about four minutes. Very easy. So yeah, the Lizmen, very, very, very good. Just gotta use them right, you know? Oh, what do we have? Oh yes, I remember this. We had like one unit of uh, this regiment of renown, Storm Vermin, and they are unbreakable, so I just had to control A and just send everyone after this guy just to uh, get the victory. Yep, he's about to go. Come on. He's got like 21 health left. Yep. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Come on. There we go. And they are gone. And I believe that is a victory. Can we see the kill counts here? Yeah, look at that. Right, so Temple Guard did really, really well, especially this guy, 101 kills. That is fantastic. Our Lord and our Saurus Old Blood getting, you know, basically a combined 80 kills there, which is fantastic. Uh, Ancient Salamanders, 170 kills together. The Bastildons not getting loads of kills, but that's not really the point. They're there for support. The Cancels, again, they went up against some large units, so they're not going to get loads. The Engine of the Gods, I definitely use that ability because 187 kills is fantastic, and that is exactly what you want to see, especially going into Skaven, where they are all numbers. All right, back to you, Miles. That concludes this section of the guide on the Lizardmen armies. Next time, we'll cover the Lords and Heroes and what they can do for you in the campaign and on the battlefield. Thanks for watching this section of my Lizardmen guide. If you want to check out the other parts, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist to the series. Don't forget to vote on the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you enjoyed this video at any point, please consider leaving it a like, as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Colin Dambers, and I'll see you next turn.